Welcome back to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 1.2 Systems. This is part two of systems. Negative feedback loops are crucial stabilizing mechanisms in all ecosystems. They occur when the output of a process inhibits or reverses that same process, which counteracts deviations and maintains equilibrium. A classic example is homeostasis in the human body. When our body temperatures rise, we sweat to cool down. Once we're cooler, we start to shiver to warm up. Both of those things bring our temperature back to normal. In ecosystems, predator-prey relationships also demonstrate negative feedback. As prey populations increase, there's more food available for predators, so predator populations rise. When the predator populations rise, they eat more of the prey, so the prey numbers decline. That induces another decline in the predator numbers. Climate systems also exhibit negative feedback, but they're more complicated by having positive feedback loops intermingled. We'll take a deeper look at that in topic six. The Daisy World model developed by Lovelock and Watson illustrates how life itself can help regulate planetary temperatures through negative feedback, contrasting sharply with lifeless planets lacking such mechanisms. I strongly encourage you to scan that QR code on the screen and check out the simulation. You can alter many of the parameters in Daisy World. And you can see just how well you're able to manipulate negative feedback mechanisms to create an equilibrium on a planet. Ecosystems as open systems exchange matter and energy with their surrounding. Ecosystems typically exist in a state of stable equilibrium. This equilibrium can be a steady state where inputs and outputs are constantly balanced, or it can develop over time through processes like ecological succession. Negative feedback loops play a crucial role in maintaining a stable state equilibrium. Back to the predator-prey relationships, the population fluctuations tend to return to a stable average over time. This average is called the carrying capacity. The lynx and snowshoe hare population may change seasonally over a few years, but over time it returns back to that same steady state equilibrium or carrying capacity. In a forest ecosystem, the balance of carbon dioxide uptake through photosynthesis and release through respiration demonstrate a steady state equilibrium. There are different times of day or different seasons when the CO2 intake and CO2 output may change, but overall it's a stable state equilibrium. Positive feedback loops amplify change in the system, potentially destabilizing it and pushing it away from equilibrium. You can think of it as the snowball effect. Unlike negative feedback, which counteracts change, positive feedback reinforces it. So one small change creates a slightly larger change, which creates a slightly bigger change, and it keeps going until it's farther and farther away from the original equilibrium. For example, in population dynamics, a declining population might lead to fewer births, and fewer births reduces the population further. This continues in a downward spiral. In climate systems, melting permafrost releases greenhouse gases, which cause more warming and melts more permafrost to release more greenhouse gases. Another example in climate change is the ice albedo effect in polar regions. As the ice melts, less sunlight is reflected, leading to more warming because the darker waters absorb that light. That melts more ice, which exposes more of the water, which absorbs more of the sunlight and leads to more warming. So this is a classic example of why positive feedback is a bad thing in ecosystems. However, I want to caution you that even though positive feedback is generally viewed as a bad thing in ecological systems, there are examples of when positive feedback is a good thing. For example, in ecological succession, initial soil improvements from the presence of lichens in your early pioneer species develop a very thin layer of soils. Those very thin layers of soil can support slightly more complex plants. As those plants go through their life cycles, they add more nutrients and biomass and organic matter into the soils, making them slightly deeper and slightly more nutrient rich, which allows them to support more complex plants. Those more complex plants add more and more organic matter and nutrients to the soil, which supports more complex plant forms and more diverse communities. So over time, soil moves further and further away from the original equilibrium of the bare rock, and it becomes deeper, more nutrient rich, and capable of supporting a much greater diversity of life. This is an example where positive feedback is actually a good thing for an ecological system. Positive feedback loops often drive systems towards tipping points. A tipping point is a critical threshold where small changes can trigger really significant, usually irreversible shifts in the system's state. These are sometimes called points of no return, or it's a regime change. Several potential tipping points exist in Earth's system. The Amazon rainforest dieback is one example where climate change induced drought can transform vast areas into savanna, and this is exacerbated by human activities related to cattle ranching. Coral reef bleaching is another example where rising ocean temperatures cause corals to expel symbiotic algae, 
potentially leading to widespread reef death and a collapse of those food webs. Permafrost thawing in Arctic regions is a third example where melting ice releases greenhouse gases, further accelerating global warming. Ocean acidification and invasive species dominance are other instances where systems may approach critical tipping point. I suggest you pause the videos and look into each one of those tipping points in greater detail. I've also shared some other tipping point videos on my website, mrcreamerscience.com, so you can check those out because I think they're directly related to what's happening here in this part of the syllabus. Tipping points within a system can lead to regime shifts between alternative stable states. Those are two stable states that are alternatives. Up to the tipping point, small changes may be offset as the system tries to maintain its original current equilibrium. However, once the tipping point is crossed, the changes further induce greater change, pushing the system farther and farther away from the existing equilibrium and into a new equilibrium state. A prime example of this is the eutrophication of freshwater systems. Large lakes can absorb excess nutrients up to a point, but once that critical threshold is crossed, it triggers rapid algal growth and decomposition, which then contributes to oxygen depletion as the algae die and decompose, and that potentially creates a dead zone. The system shifts from a clear water state to a turbid, low oxygen state, a dead zone. It's fundamentally different equilibrium that can be difficult to reverse. Models are simplified representations of reality. They're essentially tools for understanding complex systems and predicting the behavior of those systems. They can take a bunch of different forms, diagrams, graphs, equations, or verbal descriptions. For example, Earth's water budget can be modeled as a diagram showing the flows between different water reservoirs or storages. Photosynthesis can be represented by a simple chemical equation like you see here on the screen, or a more detailed diagram illustrating the process within a leaf. These models help us grasp key components and interactions within a system. That's that systems approach even if they don't capture every detail. By simplifying complex realities, models allow us to focus on the most important aspects of a system and make predictions about how it might respond to changes without actually changing the system itself. While models are valuable tools, it's important to recognize that simplifying a system inevitably involves some loss of accuracy. No model is perfect. The process of creating a model requires decisions about what to include and what to omit or leave out. This means we might leave out potential nuances that have greater effects on the system than we thought or than we anticipated. This is evident in climate change models, where simplifications can lead to a range of possible future scenarios rather than just a single definitive prediction about what might happen. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, presents multiple scenarios to account for this uncertainty. They range from worst case scenario to best case scenario. Similarly, lab-based ecosystem models may not fully capture the complexity of natural systems. Despite these limitations, simplified models remain important and crucial for understanding and predicting system behavior. Take the predictions you get out of models with a grain of salt, because the more complete the data is that a model is based on, the higher quality model you have. Emergent properties are characteristics that arise or emerge from the interactions between components in a system, which the individual parts themselves don't possess. In ecology, population cycles and food web dynamics are examples of emergent properties. The classic lynx hare population cycle emerges from the predator-prey interaction. Neither species alone is going to show this type of cyclical behavior. Trophic cascades are another example where changes at one trophic level can have far-reaching effects throughout the ecosystem. These cascades emerge from the complex interactions between species at different levels in the food web. At each level of biological organization, from molecules to individuals to communities to ecosystems to biomes, new properties emerge that couldn't be predicted solely from studying the level below. This concept highlights the importance of studying systems as a whole, not just their individual parts. That's where the connections are the essential understandings. Resilience refers to a system's ability to resist damage and recover from disturbance while maintaining its core function and structure. In both ecological and social systems, resilience helps avoid tipping points and maintain stability. For example, in a desert ecosystem, if disease reduces the wood rat population, predators like rattlesnakes and hawks might shift their diet to other prey species such as squirrels and mice. This flexibility allows the ecosystem to maintain its overall structure and function despite the disturbance. Generally speaking, the more complex a system is, with more diverse components, it tends to be more resilient. In food webs, 
Higher complexity often translates to greater resilience because there's multiple pathways for energy and matter to flow through the different parts of the food web. And that allows the system multiple ways to adapt to changes or disturbances. The resilience of a system is enhanced by two key factors, diversity and the size of its storages. Diversity provides those multiple pathways for responding to disturbance that I just mentioned. For instance, a diverse prairie ecosystem is more resilient than a monoculture crop field because if one species is affected by a disturbance, such as a drought or a flood, others can fill its ecological role. The size of storages also contributes to resilience by providing a buffer against change. A large lake, for example, can absorb more pollution without significant changes to its overall water quality compared to a small pond. The same amount of pollution dumped into a small pond is, has a higher concentration and will have a greater impact on the life that's living there. Both diversity and storage size can affect a system's response time to change often creating those time lags that we first saw earlier when we looked at the links in hair interactions. Human activities can significantly affect the resilience of natural systems, often by reducing both the diversity and the size of those key storages. Deforestation is a prime example of this dual impact. When forests are cleared, we not only reduce the diversity of plant and animal species that live there, but we also diminish the important storages of carbon, water, and nutrients that were in that standing wood. This makes the ecosystem less able to withstand future disturbances like drought or disease outbreaks. Similarly, overfishing can reduce both the diversity and the biomass of marine ecosystems, making them more vulnerable to other stressors like pollution or climate change. By understanding these impacts, we can work towards more sustainable practices that maintain or enhance the resilience of natural systems.